Aloha. Welcome to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green from the Big Island, ER physician and senator. Today I'm enjoying uh, the company of an excellent colleague, Dr. Richard Cregan, who's also a physician, legislator from Big Island, the Kona, South Kona, and Kau areas, and we're going to talk about dengue fever and the outbreak of 2015. In last week's program, well, we had the company of the state epidemiologist, Dr. Sarah Park, and her colleague talking about the vector control, Ms. Nakasone. But today I wanted to dig into kind of a comprehensive overview of dengue fever, how it's affecting our people on the Big Island, what it means to us as uh, representative and senator, and really what it means to the state. So Richard, thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. You bet. Great. So a lot of people have been uh, writing to us, they've been concerned. Uh, just by way of very brief overview, last check, we had about 112 cases confirmed by the Department right. of Health. Give me your thoughts about the dengue outbreak to date. Okay, so, you know, dengue is a serious disease, but fortunately, the first time you get dengue, you rarely die. So it's not likely to cause very many deaths. There are other concerns about it, however. Uh, so. The problem with this is we have a trajectory that is steeper than the Maui uh, trajectory of their outbreak, which they was in you know, the one in uh, 2000, what was that? 2001, and, 2001. And that was really a wild situation because it happened almost exactly when the 9-11 attack occurred. Right. And that, that hampered them. But even with that hampering, they you know, had a limited number of cases. You know, we have more than they had in Maui alone already. So that concerns me. I think also what concerns me is the Big Island is so big, and you and I have talked to many, many people that have not reported themselves or not been checked, not had their tests, even though we encourage them to go. Right. They have various reasons, you know, that they don't want to go, and uh, part of, some of it's the cost, the inconvenience, et cetera. So there are many, many people, and therefore there are houses who are not on the radar of the health department. And I think that should change, but I think the health department has to be more proactive in seeking these people out you know, having that 24-7 hotline where they can call a more rapid response. And um, I think what really bothers a lot of people is the testing uh, can involve expense because they tell them to go to their doctor or they go to the emergency room, they get charges. Uh, and the, the test itself, I think, is free. It, it should is, be. It is free. I actually went through that with the Department of Health. If a person gets a blood draw, if a physician like you or me orders the test, and they get the blood draw, there might be a three or six dollar at the most charge from clinical labs, but the test itself is being run by Department of Health and is free, therefore they won't have an expense. Of course, like you said, if you go to the ER, we know, I mean an ER doc right. could be expensive. You've been there, you spend years in the ER. Right. But just so I get totally straight, and I know what you're saying, you're saying that of the 112 cases that right. have been confirmed, tested positive, yes. there are probably many more individuals that are positive on the Big Island. Yes. There were many more that would test positive. Uh, and, you know, as you and I discussed, there was that recent uh, PNS article proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences just a few weeks ago, which clearly documented that many people with dengue do not have any symptoms at all. So maybe only one in three people who are viremic have the virus in their blood uh, have symptoms. Now, Dr. Pang and I have discussed, you know, the implications of that. And it's not clear that those people are very attractive to mosquitoes. Okay. Because as you and I know, mosquitoes are attracted to people, to things that are warm. And the, more, the warmer you are, the more appetizing you are like to mosquitoes. Like you got fever or fever. you're laying on a beach. Or, or if you're just, sunburned, right. right? People that are sunburned. Uh, and people on a beach are often sunburned. So people on a beach are particularly delectable. And I think that the uh, Huakena location where it seemed to have started is a beach park. And where you have the 80s Egypti, clearly, that's been identified there before, and I'm sure it's still there. And uh, then you have all these people who are exposed, have a lot of their skin exposed, yes. and they're warm. They're lying in the sun, the sun warms their skin, but then they get sunburned and their, their skin gets even warmer. Right. So they're very attractive, and this is during the day, and these are day-biting mosquitoes. So it was kind of the perfect storm, and I think that's why it did start there, and why it appears that there was a previous outbreak in 1993-94 mm -hmm. that started in the same place that really wasn't detected at the time it happened. Tell me a little bit more about that because I think that that hasn't been very widely discussed. So, right. so now again, for perspective, if people haven't been sure. following this as closely, 
112 cases confirmed right. dengue fever, a fever that lasts about a week, that under rare circumstances can cause dengue hemorrhagic disease, mm -hmm. can be very, very serious. But for the most part, people get better. Right. Now, many more people on the Big Island, likely positive, haven't been tested for whatever reason. We'll address that further. But this isn't the first time. It was on Maui in 2001. In 2011, there were a couple cases on Oahu. Right. And now tell me about this 1993 situation. Right. Well, in, in 93, 94, you know, I was working in the emergency department at Kona Hospital. And we were seeing a lot of cases which had the symptoms of dengue. At the time, we didn't recognize dengue. It wasn't thought to be present. And uh, as far as I know, no actual testing for dengue was done. But Testing was done for leptospirosis, tick-borne diseases. We were looking, we just never figured out what it was. And the testing for leptospirosis is very problematic because it doesn't come back for months often. Right. So you think, well, maybe they're positive, but they aren't positive. So you treat them empirically with uh, tetracyclines and, uh, you know, then you wait for the test. Well, it turns out the tests were all negative. These people got better. Nobody died during that outbreak. Uh, they were very ill, and many of them came to the emergency department, but many of them didn't, and they talked about their neighbors and other people that, that had the similar symptoms. They actually called it the Millolee flu because apparently the year before there was a similar outbreak in Millolee, which is in a similar uh, type of environment to Hoa Again, in south, the South Kona, in Kona area, area. Exactly. Very beautiful south area, Kona. very local, right. and it's hard to actually access. It's a very steep road, and you yes, get down there. right. So that one probably had very few uh, tourists involved. The one in 1993-94 had some tourists involved, but uh, I doubt, well, of course, they wouldn't have known what they had, and I, there was no indication that they were tested. Well, uh, when I was over in Pune just this past week at a community meeting, uh, after the meeting, somebody said, well, we had the dengue outbreak in 93-94. I said, what do you mean you had the dengue outbreak in 93-94? He said, oh yeah, we had hundreds of people, or you know, he may have been exaggerating, but many people there in Pune at the same time that we had the outbreak in the Hoakena, Honaunea area, had symptoms of dengue. And I said, were they positive? Were they tested? He said, yes, but I, you know, I mean, he, whether he, they were diagnosed just clinically or they actually had testing, because there was no testing in the state at that time. Right, because this is now, so 22, 23 years ago, yes. people are telling you, yes, They've been living on Big Island for right. generations, and mm -hmm. they say, yeah, we believe we had dengue fever. Now they're right. more sophisticated because they've read about it. Right. They've seen it in the papers. They've read it in the news. They've right. been on the Internet. So yeah. what did these people tell you? How do they, when they say that we had dengue fever outbreak, did they reach out to the public health department? Did they have any communication with folks then? Well, I mean, these people were reported to the public health department as possible leptospirosis cases. Yeah. Uh, David Sasaki had all their names. So when I worked for the public health department in 2003, David Sasaki and I tried to go back and find some of these uh, blood samples to test for dengue. We were never able to definitively find any of those samples as far as I know. But what is very interesting is at Yano Hall, a woman stood up and said, I was tested by the health department in 2005, along with nine other people, a total of 10 people, who had, sim you know, had, had symptoms during that 93, 94 outbreak. They, all 10 were positive for dengue. So they clearly had dengue. And they were told that by the health department. What puzzles me is that, you know, there doesn't seem that there was any follow-up to that, any evaluation of, this, of the Hoakena, any, uh, you know, attempt to eradicate the mosquitoes down there that were a clear cause of this outbreak. So I think that that, that could have been a wake-up call that was somewhat ignored, perhaps, this is clearly, this outbreak is a wake-up call that can't be ignored. Right. And I think the, the eradication of the 80s Egypti mosquito on the Big Island is very important because, as we've discussed, on the other islands, it has been eradicated. In fact, just before the, this show, we were talking about uh, the 1943-44 outbreak in Oahu of 1,500 people of dengue. And... Uh, and I would venture to guess nobody knows about that outbreak. I mean, nobody in the public practically, because I don't right. hear about this kind of thing. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about that. Okay, well, it was, you know, on Oahu, it was during World War II, so uh, dengue, the dengue outbreak was considered a uh, defense secret because they were afraid if the Japanese heard about that, that they would bomb Pearl Harbor again 
because they'd spread dengue around. Anyway, so they kept it, a, it was like a, a defense part in secret. But they were so concerned about this that at that time or thereafter, short time thereafter, the CDC, who then was in, their main focus was mosquito control. That's how they started the CDC. So they brought in 1,500 people from the mainland to help eradicate the wow. Aedes aegypti mosquito. In 1943, they brought 1,500 people to Hawaii. Yeah. Well, it was after that outbreak. The exact year, I'm not sure. But yes. the, they did, a report said that the CDC sent 1,500 people to Hawaii. Wow. That's how seriously they took it. Now, we have one coming yes. this week. And uh, I hope that we have some more coming in the future from, say, the, the Dengue branch, which is in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Yes. They did come during the Maui outbreak, and clearly, I mean, there are the CDC experts on dengue because they deal with it all the time. Let me ask you this. Uh, what's the benefit of having uh, individuals from the CDC or the dengue branch come to Hawaii? Because it's been, you know, suggested by our epidemiologist and our director of health, they've got it under control. And I, I want to say I do appreciate the incredibly hard work that's going on from Dr. Park and Dr. Pressler and the team. However, it has befuddled me slightly that we haven't wanted more and more support. As we see this outbreak emerge, why not get lots of help? I mean, so what does it mean to bring the CDC and what would be the best way to do it? What do you think? Well, you know, I, I've been told that the uh, CDC people from San Juan are willing to come. I imagine that the director of health or the governor will have to invite them and I hope that they, they do invite them. Uh, you know, this, this outbreak, for the mainland United States is unprecedented. I mean, in modern times. Yes. I mean, you know, previously they've had, you know, they had dengue outbreaks all over the South, but this, they haven't had any outbreaks for, for you know, decades, at least, you know, I think none before, after World War II. So, uh, <clears throat> I think that the CDC brings a, a kind of a new look. They're from the outside, they don't have the same relationships with people here, so they're willing to speak more frankly, perhaps. They're willing to use their experience in other countries, other places, to guide us. And they have, you know, they have also a network of people they know. So, I mean, they are, they are the world experts. I think WHO actually has many more world experts. And I think, you know, if there is a way to do this, you know, Dr. Park suggested that the president would have to ask them if that's what it takes then I think we need to ask our congressional uh, people to ask the president to say, okay, could, could the WHO come in here and help us out? I really, it's so interesting to hear you say this because I, my recollection is the, um, in the Maui outbreak, about eight people came, which is a nice cohort of people uh, to bring some eye, fresh eyes and expertise to be supportive of really what is a good Department of Health. Right. Now, when we talk about an outbreak, and we're going to take our break here in a moment, but when we talk about an outbreak, it's not just about dengue fever. It's about mosquitoes, and it's about other public health questions. And I think that's a place I'd like to pick up after our break when we talk about the potential capacity to have more input from the World Health Organization and others, because we are here in the middle of the Pacific. Right. And we are going to see infectious disease challenges going forward. And so having and building relationships with these folks may be mm. very beneficial may not be just about dengue, uh, and that might not be the only reason to bring them. So let's take our first break and okay. we'll pick up there. Great, thank you. You bet. I'm Josh Green with Healthcare in Hawaii, joined today by Dr. Richard Cregan, representative from Kona Ka'u and a physician in his own right. Aloha, I'm Carlos Juarez, host of Global Connections, and I want to invite you to come join us. We, we cover a range of global issues. We bring a lot of expert opinion, uh, a lot of issues, whether they're contemporary events happening in the world or maybe looking at things from a more historical perspective. Uh, global issues, very important for us to understand in this globally interconnected world. Join us here on Global Connections. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and I host Sustainable Hawaii every Tuesday from 11 a.m. to 12 noon. My guests offer insights on challenging economic and environmental issues facing our state and offer innovative solutions to increasing Hawaii's long-term sustainability. Recently, we've been focusing on sustainable land development, food, and energy security. If you have a project or issue you'd like to discuss on the show or would like to be a guest, please contact me 
at kirstenbturner at gmail.com. And tune in live weekly or view the show at your convenience at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo. Aloha. Welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, Senator from the Big Island ER Doc. Today I'm joined by Dr. Richard Cregan, a good friend, colleague at the legislature who works for uh, the people of South Kona and Kau and the Big Island and really all the state of Hawaii. He's been a very passionate advocate to get more response, more treatment, uh, more minds engaged on this dengue outbreak crisis, which we've had on the Big Island now for the last two or three months. Uh, in our first segment, Dr. Cregan was able to explain what it means to have an outbreak. We have about 112 cases, but as he said, very likely more because people have not sought testing comprehensively. We've now encouraged the uh, CDC to come in, and where we last left off, the World Health Organization was another organization that you and I mentioned mm -hmm. um, that might benefit the people of Hawaii if we had their engagement. Tell me why having an organization like World Health Organization, like what do they do? Why would it be valuable to the state of Hawaii to be getting input from these kind of people? Okay, the WHO, you know, has experienced all over the world with huge outbreaks, uh, huge uh, epidemics. Uh, dengue is one of their primary uh, concerns right now, but of course malaria is another one. Uh, you know, Dr. Lauren Pang from Maui actually worked with WHO yes. and on malaria and dengue. Uh, so he has good relationships with WHO, and I think that's one of the reasons that he knows them so well that he thought it would be important that they come here. Now, but let's remind people also that um, last year and, and many years, there's hundreds of millions of cases of dengue fever across the tropics. Right. That's why they're so familiar. But they don't limit, like you said, their experience to dengue. You mentioned malaria, which can be very fatal. I, I treated uh, a lot of malaria in Swaziland in right. South Africa um, back a decade ago when I was a young doc. And I mean, you see kids die in your arms of malaria. These people spend all of their time working on these outbreaks, right? Right. So why would they be interested in Hawaii and why would be, we be interested in them? I think they'd be interested in, in Hawaii because Hawaii is a developed country and uh, having outbreaks of dengue and some of these more uh, emerging diseases in a developed country is unusual. So it's, it, it has to be treated in a somewhat different way. Mm -hmm. You know, there's privacy concerns that are more paramount here than say perhaps a developing country. Um, and it's just, uh, it's such a more structured environment that, uh, you know, it's more difficult to, to deal with such a structured environment. In a more developing country, you know, there is, it can be very top down and they do whatever they want, you know, they can't do that here. That's a very interesting point you make. I, I received an email today, actually this morning from someone who, and I respect them, they asked uh, for information in their email. They said they would like to know exactly the people that are affected. And I said to them, look, I want to be candid with you. We do respect people's privacy in our mm -hmm. country. Uh, that doesn't mean we're not putting everyone's public health first and foremost uh, at the top of our list to address this kind of crisis. However, we don't go on, um, you know, we don't go on a search or a witch hunt for individuals. We make sure that we respond to their street. We make sure we get rid of freestanding water. We make mm -hmm. sure we educate everyone around them. And we also, this person made a very good point in their letter to me, that doesn't mean that they don't communicate with their neighbors, but it's very different, like you say, than in South Africa or in the Caribbean or in some other sub-Saharan uh, nation. So you bring WHO in and they're able to really learn because I assume we have flights coming from all over the world into yes. Hawaii and out of Hawaii. And yes. this doesn't end this year, if I'm not mistaken. This is gonna be, whether it's dengue or other infectious disease questions, mm -hmm. an issue for a long time to come. How are, are you worried about that? How are you thinking about those things? Okay, well, you know, when people talk about why did dengue explode, there are, you know, a number of reasons, you know, the, probably the principal reason is that mosquito control was largely abandoned because it's very expensive. And the reason for mosquito control uh, in a lot of countries wasn't malaria, it was yellow fever. Okay. And the Aedes aegypti, uh, you know, was, a, was a, a, a vector for yellow fever. Anopheles mosquitoes carries malaria, so Aedes aegypti does not carry malaria. Yes. So they're very different targets. 
So Amer uh, Central and South America largely eradicated Aedes aegypti, and of course, you know, as we discussed, our state eradicated Aedes aegypti in all but on the Big Island. Now, uh, I think I sent you that recent paper from 2013 that shows the distribution of Aedes aegypti in the Big Island. It's all over the Big Island's coast, but also a paper from Kau showed it was all, all the way up to over 2,000 feet in, in Hawaiian Ocean View Estates. So it's a very widespread mosquito, and it's a really dangerous mosquito. It, you know, it spreads dengue, mm -hmm. but it also spreads yellow fever. That's not the principal concern right now because we have a vaccine. And so with the vaccine, very few people get yellow fever these days. Let's give people a very basic comment in case they don't know. Uh, is there a vaccine for dengue fever? There is not a vaccine for dengue fever. Because of the four serotypes and the interactions with those, it's been very problematic developing a vaccine. It has to be a balanced vaccine because if you, do, if you do, don't develop enough immunity against all four serotypes, the possibility of having the same type of complication you have with second infection of dengue can happen. And the latest trial showed that there were some of these complications in younger patients who received the vaccine. So that vaccine will probably not be approved. Now, so basically, it's a very hard target. You can make a vaccine against dengue one, but then that can cause problems with dengue two and three and four. So, and now there's an emergence of dengue five and I believe Malaysia, which could make it even more problematic because if, if you have just dengue one through four in a vaccine and five emerges, of course, once you have the vaccine against dengue one through four, five is the one that's probably gonna come in. But right now it's kind of lurking. Uh, it, it came, you know, dengue basically is a, is a jungle disease of primates, monkeys and other primates. And it hides in the jungle and circulates, and then it pops out into the human population. And that's, you know, it came from Africa. Many diseases have come from Africa, and they, many diseases, just like HIV, AIDS, started in uh, African primates, emerged into people, and then spread around the world. Well, that, that's how dengue emerged. That's how some of these other diseases that are now becoming problematic, like uh, chikungunya disease and Zika, mm -hmm. which uh, Dr. Park mentioned when she was here. Yes. So, okay, so there's no vaccination. Right. And we have these darn uh, mosquitoes that are quite stout, right. the Aedes aegypti, on a large part of the Big Island. Right. What's next? I mean, I know we're hearing a lot. Uh, Department of Health has been doing some spraying with the uh, civil defense folks. Can we eradicate this mosquito? What would it take? Okay. Now, back in, you know, the, the 40s and then the 60s when they, they sort of finished it off, they had uh, a, a weapon that we don't have right now, which is DDT. Now, you know, DDT was uh, really damned by Rachel Carson in the Silent Spring, but a lot of those, that, that, that data and those, were probably not totally correct. And in fact, DDT is very safe for people. In fact, we used to use it to treat lives in the form of lindane uh, and, and put on kids' scalps until very recently. And it may still be available. But uh, it is available in Africa, you know, where, when they get uh, permission from, I believe, WHO, when they have an outbreak and they think that the only way to control it is using D the DDT. So DDT is safe for people. I, you and I have probably talked to lots of people who used to run behind the trucks and they talk about the sweet smell of DDT or, so, I don't know. It's so, quite an irony, but yes, yeah. I, I hear you. But so. you're not, so that's not available, but there are other, other tools available. And uh, some of these tools are involved genetic modification of mosquitoes, which I think uh, is a valuable possible tool, uh, you know, as you know, the Big Island and uh, many people in Hawaii are very concerned about GMOs, so that would have to be framed very carefully to get acceptance. But uh, those are not yet approved in the United States. They're being tried out in, uh, I think, Key West right now. These are, if I understand correctly for people, just as we learn together, these are mosquitoes that are genetically changed or altered so that they are sterile. Yes. And so these male mosquitoes cannot procreate and therefore quickly a mosquito population dies out. Right. The, there are at least two forms of that. One is the sterile male, mm -hmm. which they also use to eradicate like fruit flies and things. Mm -hmm. But there's another male that carries a lethal gene so that it mates with the female, 
the female lays the eggs, and they die. but they die. Okay. Yeah. So either way, either there way. are no more mosquitoes. And, yeah. and that doesn't affect the other mosquitoes, Aedes albopictus, I mean, because it's a different species, and they only breed, you know, except in laboratory studies, they only breed uh, with, with their own kind, their own, their own species. Got it. So, okay, so you said that we don't have uh, a vaccine, which, right, we right, understand no that. vaccine. We, None that's likely to emerge in, in the next few years. So it's not our, and, it, and, and I, would, I'd be, I would venture to guess that we're not going to quickly, and I don't know what the right answer is just now, but we're not going to quickly see um, a mosquito introduced that's going to help us today right. in Kona and South exactly. Kona and Kau and Big Island. So that leaves us with other sprays right. and sensible uh, decisions on people's part to get rid of freestanding water, right. to make sure you get tested if you have symptoms which are high fever, headaches, pain behind the eyes, certain rash. Right. And if you're in on the Big Island and you get any of these symptoms, it's decent idea a decent idea to talk to your doctor, call one of us, mm -hmm. speak to the public health department because we can get your test and we can at least then begin to move into a neighborhood and help out. Right. And so um, once we've taken all of those steps, um, how do we get people to really respond and participate? What's your feeling? Because if I'm not mistaken, there's still some people that don't even know that we have a dengue outbreak. Right. Haven't you told me about that? Yeah, I mean, there, there are people, I think, uh, well, yeah, actually, you mentioned uh, someone, and I saw the email, uh, someone who was on uh, Punta Beach talking to people. He, I think it was 10 out of 11 people hadn't even heard about the dengue outbreak on Hapuna Beach. Now, it happens that that part of the coastline has, has Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, but here these people are with their skin exposed, they're getting sunburned, they're getting warm, they're, you know, very appealing to mosquitoes, and they don't even know about dengue. So are they actually applying mosquito repellents? My impression was they were not. So, you know, people are putting themselves at risk unnecessarily and uh, in, in areas that are actually at much higher risk than say just walking around with your clothes on and say Kailua Kona. Right, yeah, I think that that's very an important point to make, which is that uh, though there, it hasn't been a large hotspot in the northern, uh, you know, no, northern part of the Kona coast. And that's very good, but People, when they come for vacation, we want them to be fully informed because they're going to spend time traveling south or right. they're going to spend time uh, and maybe get unlucky. And I don't think we want to scare anyone, but I think that this is a potential opportunity for us to, at the airports, educate people, right. at the hotels. You mentioned a funny thing, which I, I thought was very clever and smart, which was, you know, we're accustomed to giving a, a truffle or a, hot, or a piece of candy on people's pillow. It's not the worst idea to give them two ounces of mosquito repellent and to say, look, come and enjoy the Big Island. Come and have the most extraordinary uh, experience of paradise in your lifetime. It is a very wonderful rough and tumble place on Big Island with mm -hmm. beautiful beaches. But it is no great hardship to smear on some uh, mosquito repellent. It is certainly important, as from my perspective, and I think from that that gentleman who wrote us mm -hmm. uh, from his perspective that it's really kind of uh, it's almost a moral imperative to share with people their risk and I think you probably experienced that as a physician over a right. lifetime of your career yeah one, one other uh, thing that the, the health department has in their their paper sheets but they aren't really saying at their their meetings so far uh, is that you can wear clothing impregnated with permethrin yes and you can buy clothing impregnated with permethrin, uh, or you can buy the permethrin spray and spray it on your clothing. These are the active ingredients yes. for the bug spray. Right, yeah. So permethrin is uh, very safe. You can spray it on the clothing. Once it dries, the mosquitoes will, will be repelled and killed. And those are, those a type of clothing is widely used in uh, mainly the United States and the Midwest for hunters because they want to repel ticks, Lyme disease, and things yes. like that, as well as mosquitoes. So uh, my wife actually just ordered some, uh, I guess I'll give a shout out to Cabela's, which is a great, uh, has free shipping right now. And uh, they're uh, women's uh, permethrin impregnated clothing was half price. So you're not gonna be wearing women's clothing. No, I'm not, no, I'm not. But you know, our good friend, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I am drafting a, a letter to my, our good friend, Dr. Kasasa yes. of the ABC stores and suggesting that 
he might consider carrying some permethrin and impregnating clothing. Yes. You know, and uh, my wife thought it's a great idea. Get that letter out. <laughs> I think this is a good opportunity for us to take another break. Uh, this is Josh Green with Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm joined by Dr. Richard Cregan, colleague from the Big Island of the Legislature, and we're talking about the dengue fever outbreak of 2015. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of uh, Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people collaborate and, and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there, 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. Aloha. My name is Kaui Lucas. I am the host of Hawaii is My Mainland here every Friday on Think Tech Hawaii at 3 p.m. I invite people who are doing interesting and inspiring things in our community to help us keep it local and keep it real. Tune in any Friday, 3 p.m. and also available on our YouTube channel and my blog, kawilucas.com, Hawaii is my mainland. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm Josh Green, your host from the Big Island, Senator and Physician. Today I'm joined by a colleague and good friend, Dr. Richard Cregan, also a physician. Lots and lots of experience in clinical care. Joined, the legis joined me at the legislature several years ago uh, as a leadership, has a leadership role on the health committee in the House and has been very, very vocal and uh, intelligent about his approach to dengue fever on the Big Island as we've had an outbreak of 112 cases to date uh, that have been confirmed. In our first couple segments, we talked about how uh, there are probably a lot more individuals that have been infected with dengue uh, who haven't been tested. We've talked about what's been a pretty um, challenging response uh, on our island, on Big Island. At first, we were a bit slow out of the gate, but the Department of Health has really stepped up their efforts. They're deep into the communities now. They're sending teams, and we want to commend their hard work. Uh, Dr. Park, Dr. Pressler, uh, they have a lot of uh, passion to deal with this problem now, and it's a gigantic problem. Uh, if you've been following, I think, the media, you've seen uh, that Dr. Cregan and myself have uh, called for extra res uh, response, extra support from the CDC and the World Health Organization uh, we know from uh, conversations with our own constituents how important it is to be able to educate the community, not just through public meetings, but by getting into the communities. And I think that the Department of Health has now done a better job in the recent weeks doing that. Uh, I want now to turn this back to you and say, uh, Richard, now that we've had a very significant outbreak of an infectious disease, dengue fever, on the Big Island of Hawaii, what comes next? How would you like to see us approach public health, especially issues like uh, outbreaks that are uh, mosquito-borne in our state? Okay. First, I, I want to thank you for mentioning the, uh, the new uh, efforts by the Department of Health to go out to the community and actually having paramedics drawing blood. And, you know, that I'm sure it wasn't just our suggestion that, that triggered that, but, you know, that was something we felt was important, and we're, I'm very happy that they are doing that now. Yes. Okay, so going forward, why is it so important, even if this outbreak uh, is controlled, to control mosquitoes on Oahu? One, dengue is not the only disease out there that's very dangerous and mosquito-borne. Uh, there are two uh, diseases, and I, I mentioned them, chikungunya and Zeta, that Dr. Park is concerned about, and with good reason. They are showing a similar path to dengue. Chikungunya has been particularly problematic in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. but also in the islands of the Pacific. What do these viruses do to people? Do they cause kind of similar symptoms that dengue causes? You know, that's a great point, because since they do cause those symptoms, they can be confused with dengue. And as far as I know right now, people who are tested for dengue are not automatically tested for chikungunya or, or Zeta, whereas in other places like Japan, they test for all three. Uh, and, you know, without doing that additional testing, you may say, oh, they didn't have dengue, so they're good. Well, maybe they had chikungunya, which is a concern, or maybe they had Zeta. And you can actually have, you know, a recent report said uh, a child returning from Thailand to Japan had both 
dengue and chikungunya at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we have to be proactive about these other diseases. Those diseases, uh, you know, there was a, okay. So there was a recent outbreak, I mean, I'm not sure when, how many years ago, but just a few years ago on Reunion Island, an island very similar to our islands, a, a volcanic island in the Indian Ocean. It's a French island, mm -hmm. you know, uh, about 750,000 people. Yes. They have basically just 80s albopictus, you know, the, the tiger mosquito, the one that is considered less problematic for dengue. And they thought they were good for chikungunya because uh, there had been no uh, big outbreaks or epidemics of chikungunya without Aedes aegypti. Well, okay, chikungunya came in to their country and exploded. They had 250,000 cases and now studies are showing that they had a number of deaths from cephalitis, they had uh, a number of other problems. So uh, it really overwhelmed their healthcare system, caused brain damage and death in a number of people. Because viruses, for those who might not be healthcare providers, viruses like this sometimes are benign, cause mm -hmm. some flu-like right. symptoms or no symptoms, right. sometimes cause these high fevers and aches, terrible aches and pains like right. we've described before, headaches, and sometimes, God forbid, can cause inflammation or swelling in some of the tissues of the body, and if it's in the brain, can cause traumatic and terrible, terrible outcomes, and that's what you're describing. Right, yes. Yeah. Some, I mean, some of the people were just had brain damage, uh, others were killed and died. And, you know, it's not a huge percentage, but, but the, you know, we're thinking about, you know, dengue as being, well, you know, not that problematic, but as the numbers climb, and, you know, Reunion was not a primitive island, it's a French island, very actually uh, developed, actually, yes. you know, a tourist destination for many French people. So they had pretty good resources, but for, so for them to have 250,000 cases with albopictus means we in Oahu could have 250,000 cases. And you can imagine what that would do to our healthcare system yes. and how many people would die and how many, how it would just overwhelm the people and people would die because they, you know, the healthcare facilities would be so overwhelmed that they'd be dying of other things. Yes. Yeah, I think that that's been a point that um, we've been trying to make as Big Island physicians, which is there's a shortage of doctors, which everyone has um, heard us talk about ad nauseum on this program and others. There's a shortage of nurses. Right. There are people who live in poverty. There are people who are immigrants and are a little bit wary of, you know, taking advantage of any kind of structure like the healthcare system. All of those issues combined, when combined with an additional challenge, like an outbreak from a terrible mosquito that carries dengue fever or chikungunya mm -hmm. could put us into a spiral that we can't recover from. And I think that if it becomes endemic on the big island, right. people have to realize that our concern has been what happens when it props up in Honolulu, when Lahaina or other parts of the state also where there's dense population get it. And then we will not have the capacity to care for people. So you're recommending a more proactive position, which I think is why you've been studying this so hard and talking about the World Health Organization and the right. CDC. I, yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the issues that uh, sort of has, has been brought up, but, you know, not discussed that fully, and people have asked about it, some of the community meetings, about isolation and quarantine. Now, I, I'm just talking, yes. giving the CDC definitions. Isolation separates sick people with a contagious disease from people who are not sick, which makes sense. Yes. Even if it's mosquito borne. Quarantine separates and restricts the movement of people who are exposed to a contagious disease to see if they become sick. So they have no symptoms, but say they're living in a house with people who have symptoms, does it make sense to quarantine them? In other words, say, look, stay away from the public for a while. Yes. Now, yellow fever is a quarantinable disease under U.S. law. Because it's so nasty it will kill you. Well, it, yes, it's, it's quarantinable even though it's mosquito bargaining. It's not trans transmitted by person to person, right. but it can be lethal. Yes. You know? So dengue in the primary form when you get it the first time is, is not usually lethal. If you get it a second time with a second uh, type, you have a 20% chance, if you aren't treated aggressively, of dying. Now, with modern treatment, 
maybe you can get it down to 3%. For instance, in Samoa, where it is endemic, and that's what we don't want for yes. the island, they had over 400 cases this year, 130 hospitalizations, our hospitals probably were overwhelmed, and four deaths. Now, we don't want any deaths. Right. And, you know, that is why we have to be, be I think, so proactive on this. It's, you know, uh, another disease we talked about and Sour Park raised yes. as a concern is Zika. Well, Zika is a flavovirus, uh, you know, similar to dengue, yes. with actually perhaps milder symptoms for the most case, but uh, th there was an outbreak in Yap, which isn't that far away from us, in 2007 or 2009. Now, Zika in Brazil now has been shown to have caused over 700 children with brain damage that have microcephaly, in other words, tiny heads, yes. and, uh, you know, severe deformity. We do not want that disease to come in here, but if it comes in here, the only way we can control it is really by controlling the mosquitoes. So we have to be proactive with controlling mosquitoes, and Aedes aegypti is the main vector of that as well. So we got to get rid of that on the Big Island. See, I, I'm so pleased that you're looking at this from a broad perspective because though we have the concerns as fathers and grandfathers and, you know, husbands and so on about our community and our family this year, right mm -hmm. now, we also have to be mindful of what the future holds for Hawaii. Right. And here we are, a wonderful place uh, for people to use as a destination, in mm -hmm. some ways the destination of their lives. Right. People talk about coming to Hawaii more than anywhere else for that destination vacation that they dream of. We are going to have lots and lots of people. We're also going to have other things. We're going to have global warming. We are going to have outbreaks of infectious disease in serious ways. Uh, a few years ago, the Department of Health dealt very well with mm -hmm. the Ebola concern. Right. This year, we are ramping up our response. But two years from now, it could be chikungunya. It could be uh, Zika. Zika. It could be goodness knows what. And I think that if we enhance our capacity, is what you seem to be saying, right. to bring public health uh, personnel and resources and know what to get out there, right. we won't have to worry about yeah. outbreak over outbreak. Is that right? Yeah, and, you know, and Josh, you know, you and I and the legislature, you know, and the whole administration, you know, bear some responsibility because you know, uh, under the Republican administration, they cut back the vector control, the pe people who control mosquitoes on the Big Island from 14 to 2, mm -hmm. so they haven't been able to do hardly anything. And we, I think we stored two of those positions last year, and they haven't even filled them yet. But we got to really push now, you and I and, and the rest of the legislature, to give them the support that they need. Now, I mean, they say they're good. Well, I don't think they are good. We need to proactively, in this session, Yes. Provide the support, both uh, you know structural and perhaps, and but definitely financial support, so that they'll have the resources to do what they have to do, and what the CDC recommends and WHO recommends to make our safe and keep our safe safe for both our citizens but also for our visitors. Because if we don't keep our visitors safe, they're not coming back. Right. I think uh, I don't know if anyone could have said it better. I think that looking forward proactively. Having more resources today will solve problems tomorrow. We've heard many, many concerned individuals uh, reach out. People out there are scared. I think that we now, I'm hoping, are turning the corner on dengue fever. I'm hoping against hope that this response has prevented it from exploding anywhere else. We are very, very hopeful that there right. won't be a big outbreak in Hilo or in Pune and, God forbid, here on Oahu but only by being vigilant, by being proactive, like you said, and funding these programs and making sure people are 100%, not 80%, not 90%, 100% aware of how they can help their property and their community right. will we prevent future outbreaks. So thank you again, Richard, for joining me. I think that we will have a follow-up program in a couple months, no doubt. Okay. Uh, we want people to be aware, so please, reach out to the Department of Health, look at their website, reach out to Representative Cregan or myself, if you have questions, we're here to answer them. We don't want the dengue outbreak to uh, stymie people's visits. We don't want you to be afraid out there, but we want you to be safe and healthy. Thank you for joining me. I'm Josh Green with Healthcare in Hawaii, today joined by my expert colleague, Dr. Richard Cregan from the Big Island.